Well, the first thing that always comes to mind when I hear statistics like that is how much of it is sort of natural optional, you know, like women just don't want to do this shit and so they're choosing not to do it and how much of it is irrational and, you know, comes down to a moment where a woman's like, well, I kind of want that job, but it would be difficult. I'd have to deal with all this bullshit, you know there's really only a place for in, you know, in this world for men, so even though I want to do it, I'm going to go over here. And those are really hard answers to find because they're subtle and they're small. And, you know, this is like one of the general problems with feminism is like it's so deeply rooted and the, and the issues are so complex that you can't just look at a statistic and say like, we need to fix this and make it 50-50 because that's not natural either. Um, and, you know, as a woman who's been in the music business for whatever, 15 years or something, you know, all I have to go from is my experience. My experience working in clubs, my experience being on a bus with a bunch of dudes, my experience being with fans. And since I've done so much independent work to just create my own experience, generally my experience has been awesome. You know, I have experienced very little sexism in my workplace, but that's also because I'm the boss in my workplace. I'm not working for someone else. I chose to like step on the top and like hire everyone else under me and run the show. If I were working in a nightclub and like doing sound, I might have a really different experience. And I do have to say it's always really shocking to me to walk into a club and like the woman doing front of house is a woman. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, 99 times out of 100, you're a guy. It's great to see a woman there. That happened to me on a plane the other day. The captain came on and for the first time in my entire life, the captain of a flight was a woman. And I was like, holy fuck, this is just like, you don't even realize how used to it you get until you're used to hearing the stewardess talk and all of a sudden the captain is a woman telling you about the weather conditions and you're like, wow, this is, it's so rare that it almost feels just baffling that we're so normalized to men having certain jobs and women having certain jobs, you know? And we all take part in it, you know. I, I notice that all the time when, when I think about, you know, 
the person who's going to do the merchandise, it's usually the merch girl. I mean, you think about the person who's doing the sound, it's usually the sound guy, and that's just the way it's been. Um, well, because people are human and, and they're all flawed, there is no perfect person. I mean, to me, my favorite role models are the ones who are very imperfect, but they're very human and they're very honest about how they do it, their own messiness, their own conflicts, their own insecurities, and they're just very authentic about their own problems and their position in the world. And I, I feel that in Patti Smith. And I feel that in Bjork, and you know, I feel that in Nina Simone and stuff. But in all of those women, like, I could point out flaws and like things that aren't good things for role models. But fuck that, actually. Like, if you're looking for a perfect person, you'll never find one. They don't exist. Which is also problematic when you start pointing to one person as the one who got it right. Like, no one's fucking got it right. No man, no woman, no one ever. Like. You know, even Gandhi, even Mother Teresa, like, they had their problems. <laughs> so, you know, and we like to generalize and we like to put people up on pedestals and people put me up on a pedestal. And I always try to be really quick to say, like, I don't have this shit figured out. I'm, like, dealing with it as clumsily as anybody else. But it's also important to keep in mind, like, share your mistakes. Be honest about what you're trying to figure out. If you act perfect, you're just fucking up the system. You're not. No one is. Um, well, it was like a lot of things that's happened to me in my career, it was a pile of pros and cons because it happened and in a weird way, I was almost happy it happened because I was like, okay, finally you fuckers did something so specific that I can just blog about it and tell my fans about it because the insidious nature of the record label was that like they were always very friendly and helpful, but then there would be these subtle things that would happen and they just, they wouldn't live up to their promises. But there was never like one obnoxious concrete thing where I could point and say like, this is why it sucks. And that was one great concrete thing where they came to me so directly and so obnoxiously to say, we don't want these scenes in your video. We don't think you look attractive. And I was just like, I just went armed with that to my blog and I knew that the minute I blogged that, it was the end of my relationship with the label, but it was crumbling anyway. And I was just like, it was like the nail in the coffin and I had the hammer and I just went, <laughs> that's it. Um, and, you know, it's, it was funny, like, talking about, um, you know, nudity in music videos. Like, in the case like that, like, the dudes in the office would have preferred I be wearing a suit instead of naked because they didn't think I had the right kind of body to be alluring and sexy and sell records. And I mean, one of the things I hated about being on that label is they, they didn't even understand who I was talking to. They didn't understand that my fans loved the fact that I was human. They somehow thought that I was supposed to be a pop icon selling records and hawking myself to like the general public, which was one of the biggest problems because if they had been smart, and, and they wanted to make money and be greedy. They would have been greedy with my fan base, but they were so out to lunch, they couldn't even do the math to realize that they were hawking their product, me, to the wrong people. I think what that says about the music industry is that they spend their lives sitting behind desks and not looking at reality. I mean, and, and I think it also tells you that art and business are like very, very hard to reconcile. Because when you have an office full of people who are just like trying, working very hard, but following a set of rules just having to do with commerce, money, the bottom line, you know, the pie charts that they're used to looking at, and not looking at the depth and the complexity of what an artist does and how an audience reacts to that art, 
you know, there's very, very few instances where the art and the business just combine beautifully and explode. And when it happens, it's great, but it, in, especially in rock and roll, like those moments are rare. And for every female pop or rock artist that's ever existed, you usually have a, a horror story like this, where you have the art on the one hand, and the, I'm the commodity on the other hand, and you can't figure out how to put it together. This is kind of the Miley Cyrus Sinead argument, you know, it's just, it's like, has anyone done it beautifully? You could even look at Madonna and say, she did it really well for a while, but then it's like, every woman I've talked to lately is so angry at Madonna because she had this chance to be like this feminist icon and it feels like she kind of sold out and just wants to, you know, remain this aesthetic perfection instead of being honest with everybody. And that kind of makes us all mad because she has, she's holding that power and she's kind of letting it, you know, disintegrate. It's a blurry, blurry line, right? And, the, and this is the conversation that's happening around the whole Miley Cyrus thing is there's all these levels and the more then the deeper you get and the more levels you talk about, the more problems you have. Because you can say that she's empowered to make her own decisions, and maybe she is. I mean, maybe she's sitting there at the table going like, all right, I know exactly how to play this game. But if the game is fucked up, then do we applaud her for playing the game correctly? You know, and that's, this is the basic problem. This is why no one can agree about it, is because if you're an empowered woman in a fucked up system, and you're just playing and gaming the system that exists, but we all hate the system, is it really power? And that's an impossible question to answer, and it's why there has to be a more complicated and complex approach. Because, you know, you can look at the Madonnas and the Lady Gagas and the Miley Cyruses and say, like, they are winning. They're winning all the money, they're winning all the fame, but they're playing the game of a corrupt system. And there has to be there have to be women out there who are willing to like ride the balance and the balance is difficult because everybody knows what it takes in pop to get attention and like getting naked will get you attention doing doing the super super sexual over sexualized thing will get you attention like everybody likes looking at boobs and you know as long as there's antidotes and alternatives to that and you know looking at Bjork or Grimes or Laurie Anderson or artists who or Marina Abramovich or artists that like will occasionally use nudity but you definitely get the impression that they are choosing deeply choosing to use nudity for artistic purposes and for connection purposes and not just because they know that that's the way to hawk the product and no one's up there giving you a scorecard or grade and making rules about whether you got it right or not. You know, it's just everyone having their own little opinion on the internet. But I think the most important part is for the upcoming crop of female musicians to just know that they have the entire choice from like totally sex over sexualized, like highly perceived as degrading over here to like you know, being an absolute nun, or I think like really smart artists like <laughs> running back and forth those two points and going, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I can do anything I want and I'm in control. And if I'm over here, I'm playing the game. And if I'm over here, I'm playing a different game and I can play whatever game I want. Because it's like with everything else in feminism, if you know you have a choice, but you are only making this one choice because all the other choices are too scary, you're not really liberated, you're stuck. You're intellectually free, but you're emotionally fucked. And it's, that's with everything from makeup to shaving to how we present ourselves. You know, one of the things like with shaving, you can watch tons of women be like, well, there's a choice, you know? It's either the choice to shave or the choice not to shave. And of course I'm choosing not to shave because it's easier, but I have a choice. If you're never exercising the other choice because you don't want people to blame you, stare at you, complain about you, judge you, you really are trapped. And that's why you need a critical mass to, to fix it.
My fans are ruining this yeah. interview. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up! <laughs>it's everybody's problem and job to fix the imbalances and the unfairnesses against men and women i mean i think there's like a there's a silent suffering that goes on with men too as far as how they feel like they have to act they have to be they are perceived and um you know we are we're in trouble as a planet and it's not very sexy or romantic to talk about it but if you look around with, with climate change, we may not have very much longer to fix these subtle things. And it, it may be that we need a massive revolution if we actually want to stick around and continue to enjoy living here as a bunch of people. And what's amazing to me is I'm, I'm starting to see more and more of a connection between feminism and our general desire as human beings to save this place and to continue to live here because this planet is made up of a lot of women. There's billions and billions of us and most of us feel very helpless and disempowered and disconnected from each other after years and years and thousands of years of like separation and cultural mandate and disconnection. And sometimes when I think about it, you know, if a if the correct feminist revolution took place and it were up to the several billion women on this planet, how we ran it, what we changed, whether or not we fixed, you know, the global ecological catastrophe, my guess is that the women, if given their voices, would be making very different decisions than men because they're inherently protective of the human race. And uh, you may actually really, I mean, it's great to see this, this resurgence in feminism and women really trying to f talk to each other and listen to each other. Because if we can do it quickly, and we can find each other quickly in every realm, from medicine to music to uh, all over the arts and the sciences and education, if we can find some common ground, you know, to, to kind of, take back the conversation and actually get in control of the parts of the planet we can fix, we might have a chance in hell of, of reversing the damage which looks like it's eminently about to destroy the human race. Not to get too serious on you, but it, it feels that serious when you read about what's happening right now to our planet. So one hopes that we can find each other. I think it's easier to be a female in the music industry today because we have so much access to each other and more access to the tools that we just didn't used to have. The internet being the obvious one, but our computers, our ability to record, our ability to figure simple things out, you know, without having to go to the machine. Back in the 70s, if you wanted to be a recording female artist, like your options were so fucking limited. You know, you, you had very few chances. And now, if you're an ambitious, hardworking, clever 18-year-old girl and you've written some great songs, you can do, you can pretty much fucking do it yourself. And if you're smart about it, you can find an audience. So I think we're in much better shape. Of course, the, the internet also opens us up to a lot of ugliness and a lot of evil and a lot of criticism. And that's, that's just the ugly flip side of the beauty of it. I don't aspire to change anything with my music and art. I think if I get specific about it, the minute you start having an agenda, like a pointed, targeted agenda with your art, you, you're in trouble. I think our job as artists is to just be as honest and authentic as possible. And like, you know, you throw your, out in the, you throw your art out into the world and you hope that it lands and you hope that it resonates and you never know how, you never know why. And, you know, I'm often just amazed at what happens. The songs that people love, the ones that people connect to that I didn't think they would, the ones that I thought they would connect to that they don't. Um, but 
you know, being an artist is really hard that way. You can't have an agenda because if you've got an agenda, you'll never get what you want. You'll always feel stuck and you'll always feel unheard. But if you just, if you let go, if you make your art and throw it out there and say, I don't know what the results are going to be, but I hope to God they're just good, you wind up a much happier artist <laughs> because you're not always constantly not getting what you expected. Yeah, it's always hard to dispense like soundbite advice because it always it really depends who you are and what kind of personality you have and what kind of music you make. But if I were to give any kind of advice to a woman who's just starting out, don't forget that your first job, first and foremost, is that you're, you're kind of in a service position. And I think people forget this, especially because so many people are wrapped up in like X Factor, American Idol, like that the idea of the job is to be famous. The idea of the job is not to be famous, it's to connect with real people. And you're actually, if you're a good artist and a good singer and a good songwriter, you actually realize that it's, you're actually serving someone else. They're not there for you, you're there for them. And if you can approach your work that way, your stage life, your touring, not as an egotist, but kind of as a, as a servant, it really helps to put the whole thing in perspective because as an artist, if you're gonna be helpful in society, you know, and you've chosen to be an artist instead of an engineer or a computer programmer or a physicist, you know, you're still there to do a job. And so many artists struggle with this like, Am I being a narcissist? Is this a selfish job to pick? Am I just an asshole? You know, is, you know, is everyone going to think that I'm just like this greedy attention getter for wanting to be on stage and have everyone look at me? It took me like 10 years to figure this one out. But once you realize that you're actually providing something necessary by being on stage, it can liberate you to just get rid of all that crap and do your job. Because it is a job. And it's a really worthwhile, important job, especially when you see what you're able to give to and open up in other people who resonate with and understand your music. And just being able to give yourself the permission to get up there and, and be as crazy and open as you want without thinking that all of society is going to be like, huh, ah. you know, you're just doing this for the attention. Especially with women, because women just get such a fucking bad rap as soon as they express themselves. There's just all of this sort of derision. And, you know, even today I saw like on a news uh, uh, some bullshit news website, you know, like Miley Cyrus's top 10 attention-getting moments. You know, would you see that with Bono or Mick Jagger or Prince, you know? All artists are there to get attention, but they're there to get attention and transform it into something valuable. And you have to know that as the artist so you don't get trapped, because if you believe everybody else, you really will turn into an asshole. And you have to not do that. That's my advice. Camera people in 
my dressing room. <laughs> Motherfucker. Yeah, that was Cam Nate's Okay. I think you best like Skidaddle. You understand skedaddle? I'm from Seattle. He's from Seattle. <laughs> they don't skedaddle in you Seattle. Know, you know skedaddle in Seattle? I don't fucking think so. Oh! oh God, <laughs> see? Get down! Get down! Uh, yeah. one, one quickie? Yeah. Uh, you yeah. look so good. Yeah. I love the touches. When, uh, yeah. when I get on the stage, I'm going to take this off. I'm gonna put it near my new case. Can you just make sure we get it the other night? You don't put any of your towels up there. Oh, I yeah, just put towels up there. You're gonna tell when your suit doesn't tell when it's great. So that shit will probably start walking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh.